it comes to NFL content here on YouTube, draft grades are far from a new concept. There's plenty of people out there who will talk about their favorite drafts or their least favorite drafts. People that have a channel dedicated to a specific team will focus on that team's draft. There's guys out there like I did last year who will talk about the draft in its entirety, but break it down into eight videos going division by division. There's other people who will just make one video talking about the draft at large and be done with it. All of those are very valid and quite frankly, correct ways of going about this whole draft content thing. However, because I wanted to be different, back in the month of May, I decided that I was going to do one video for every single NFL team. 32 videos throughout the months of May and June talking about the draft and grading every single pick. Here we are at the end of August, and I still have two whole divisions left to do. So that didn't work out, and I found out very quickly why I had seen no one else do this. Now that being said, I made a commitment. I owe it to both myself and to you, the viewer, to complete this, to go through with these last eight teams, these last two divisions, and hand out my grades for the 2024 NFL Draft. Now that being said, because we are in late August, preseason has ended cut day is either rapidly approaching or in the past by the time you're watching these videos and we've seen camp and you know the development that these rookies are already undergoing just know that that's not really factoring into these grades now there have been a couple exceptions here and there i make sure to disclose when those are but for the most part these grades were grades that i wrote down in you know early may and have stuck to now, that being said, if there's a grade that is already showing signs of aging poorly, then I will tell you, hey, this is how I felt about this player before the draft. However, it looks like he's already starting to prove me wrong. I will happily admit that, and we can all laugh at me taking forever and being a big, dumb, stupid idiot. Also with that, please try to keep in mind that I'm not trying to say that I am better or know better than any of the GMs that get mentioned in these videos. I'm just a 21 year old college kid who spent what little free time he had during the spring, you know, taking a look at film and scouting prospects and doing what I could to the best of my ability. And I like sharing my opinions on this kind of stuff. You guys seem to like it when I share my opinion on this kind of stuff. So I'm going to continue to do it. But without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about the Indianapolis Colts and what they did during the 2024 NFL Draft. Man, what can be said about this Colts roster that hasn't already been said? I mean, the upside with this team is immense. You've got Anthony Richardson, who has everything you'd want in a quarterback and more, the potential to be this, like, super weapon of a passer in a league where you really need that, you know, with the Mahomeses and the Lamar Jacksons and the Josh Allens, the Joe Burrows, the Justin Herberts, all just in the AFC, and even in your own division with CJ Stroud and Trevor Lawrence, like, you gotta have a guy that can keep up. Anthony Richardson, despite only playing a few games last year, is probably gonna be one of those guys. I have a lot of faith in him. Take a look at some of the pieces he's got to work with offensively. We've got Jonathan Taylor, one of the 10 best running backs in the league. That's a sick tandem in the backfield to run the ball. Uh, you got Michael Pittman, who's a really solid number one receiver. Alec Pierce, who's a pretty solid receiver in his own right. Josh Downs, who looked awesome as a rookie last year, a guy I'm a big fan of as a North Carolina fan. Uh, you've got some interesting tight ends with Kylan Granson and Mo Ali Cox, who get the job done. You know, they're solid safety blankets. That's all they need to be. Jelani Woods, if he's healthy, has the potential to be a little bit more than that. You got a good offensive line. You got a good defense. Some big names like DeForest Buckner and Grover Stewart, who are, I would say, arguably the best one two punch at defensive tackle in the league. Uh, you've got Kenny Moore, who's an incredible nickel corner. You've got Zaire Franklin and EJ Speed, two of the more underrated linebackers in the sport. You've got some other fun young play players uh, like Adi Tamiwa Adabare from last year, who I absolutely loved coming out of Northwestern. I'd love to see more of him this year. Uh, Juju Brents obviously had a really solid rookie season. Like this team has so much potential, so much upside. So going into the draft, the question was, how do you build on that? Right. That was the goal for the Colts. They needed to find out how do you build on this upside? The answer is by having a really good fucking draft and they were able to accomplish just that, starting out with their first pick here being Liatu Latu, the edge out of UCLA, the first defender off the board, in my humble opinion, the best defender in this entire class by a decent margin. Uh, on my big board, he was ranked sixth 
among all players. Top rated defender, guys ahead of him, Marvin Harrison, Caleb Williams, Joe Alt, Drake May, Roma Dunze. Latu came in next. And I can tell you right now, in the handful of years that I've been doing this, you know, the whole evaluating draft prospects thing and really taking it seriously, Latu is by far and away the best defensive lineman or the best edge rusher, rather, that I have evaluated. And I would say he's arguably the best defensive lineman, period. I think it comes down to him and Jordan Davis. Uh, but, you know, over guys like Will Anderson, Kayvon Thibodeau, uh, Trayvon Walker in your own division, Aiden Hutchinson, uh, you know, all these different guys, Tyree Wilson, who I know wasn't super impressive last year, but I still love Tyree Wilson. Latu was by far and away, in my opinion, the best of those guys coming out. And that's because he is the super polished player who still has room to grow. And when I say he still has room to grow, I don't mean like, oh, there's one area of his game where he just totally sucks and needs to fix it. No, the weakest area of his game is his bull rush. This is a guy with an incredible first step. He's six foot five, weighs 260 pounds and has 32 and five eighths inch arms. He can further add on to that bull rush. The issue with his bull rush wasn't that he didn't use it or he couldn't use it. It was that he didn't have to because he has all these different ways to attack you that simply bull rushing an opponent probably felt boring, probably felt a little less than optimal when you can hit him with this crazy swipe move or this crazy rip move or, you know, spin around to make him look stupid. Just jump on the outside, hit their outside shoulder and go like lots you, you know, he, he didn't use that bull rush a whole lot, but it was more because he didn't need to, like I said. Now, sure, in the NFL, you're going to want to see him develop that because when you're playing against better tackles, there are going to be times where you just have to put your head down and go. I think he's more than capable of doing that at a high level. I, I think Latu is an absolutely incredible player. And more importantly, I would say he is the perfect fit for what the Colts needed. Because you look at this Colts defensive line, you've got the, the interior down pat, right? Buckner, Stewart, Adabare, uh, even guys like Raekwon Davis, Taven Bryan, and then Jonah Laulu, who we'll talk about later if he ends up making the roster. There's a lot of uh, a lot of good things going on there. Defensive end, not saying there aren't good things going on, but there's no true like alpha in this edge room. You've got Quiddy Pay, who has all the makings of an incredible number two, an incredible Robin to somebody's Batman. You've got Taekwon Lewis, who's really solid. You got Deo Odeyingbo, who's really solid. You just don't have that true alpha. That's where Latu comes in. That's where this big, beautiful bastard out of UCLA comes in to save the day as that true alpha on your defensive line, as somebody who can just be a true game wrecker against the pass and do a lot better than I feel like people give him credit for against the run. Now, sure, he's no Khalil Mack. He's no Montez Sweat. He's not like an elite run defender. He's good. He's pretty damn good at it. He's got the instincts. He's got the ability to read and recognize things. Sure, there's going to be times where maybe he gets displaced a little bit, Work on that over time. You know, he's playing a hand in the dirt defensive end rather than being the true uh, outside linebacker edge rusher like he was at UCLA. Maybe he bulks up a little bit. Maybe that's in the cards for him. You know, granted, you don't have to bulk up all that much at 260 pounds, but you get what I mean, right? I think there's a lot of great stuff going on with Law too. Like I said, high IQ, great eye discipline, Pass rushing tool belt is off the charts. His really good hip movement is a hop chop move that is just killer. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, he's really good at switching up his moves and not attacking the same way on back to back plays. He's just a super refined pass rusher that is going to be a game wrecker at the next level, like I already said. And getting that on this defensive line with some of the other pieces you have is scary. Not for you, but for everybody you got to play. This is the type of player that breaks games, that changes your defense single-handedly. You get him here at 15, the best defensive player in this class. I know, you know, I got to bring it up, the medicals, right? He uh, had to medically retire from football temporarily. He's been perfectly healthy for two years, and the Colts are willing to take him in the top 15. You know, I, I think that probably speaks volumes to the guy's health and where it's at right now. So I don't have any concerns about that. I don't have any concerns about Latu, period. He's one of the best players in the class, one of my favorite players in the class, one of the best picks, easily one of the best value picks. Uh, just absolutely incredible stuff from the Colts. 
And then in the second round, they do the same goddamn thing. They get this incredible football player that had no business being around in the second round and Adonai Mitchell out of Texas. No world where this man should have been available in the 50s. No world where this man should have been available past the top 15. It's unreal. You look at the receivers in this class. This is one of the best, one of the deepest receiver classes in recent memory. He's a top four guy easily. Like, in fact, I would argue there is a world where you could have said he was even higher than that. For me, Marvin Harrison, Roma Dunze, and Malik Neighbors were the top three. I think that was pretty consensus. Maybe not in that order. I know a lot of people had Neighbors over Dunze, vice versa. Um, but with those three, like, there's a world where I could see Mitchell being a better ball player long term than a Malik Neighbors and even an Odunze, as much as I don't want to admit it because I'm a Bears fan and I want Rome to be the best receiver from this class. If you came from the future in 10 years and told me Adonai Mitchell is the best receiver in football, I would not be shocked. This is a dude who has everything. You know, you talk about comps. I'm not original with this, but there's a lot of CD Lamb in his game. CD Lamb, in my eyes, is the second best receiver in football behind Justin Jefferson, right? He's got this really smooth ability to, you know, just get downfield and he has so much nuance in his routes that almost make it seem like he's moving in slow motion. That's where a lot of that CD Lamb comes in. Shout out to Brett Coleman for really like, you know, putting that together, right? Because you watch him run routes and you're like, man, this is beautiful. Brett really explained it well for me. I'm not ashamed to admit, like that's not an original take of mine uh, when it comes from Brett, right? That That's that's the, the football YouTube messiah right there. Uh, but he's just this incredible mover. And sure, uh, you got the concerns about his diabetes and whether or not he's going 100% on every route. I'm not super worried about that. You know, I feel like going to the NFL with the whole diabetes thing, if it's a personal, like uh, the concern with the diabetes is his attitude, right? There, there were times at practice where he'd get hostile or he'd get hotheaded diabetes when your blood sugar gets low i'm not speaking from experience and i'm not a doctor so if i'm a little bit off please excuse me but to my understanding when your blood sugar drops you get pissy you know the, the for lack of better words it's like the snickers commercials you're not you when you're hungry you're not you when your blood sugar's a little bit lower and considering there was a case of a few years back regarding the ncaa and how they treated student athletes in terms of making sure they were fed and taken care of I wouldn't be surprised if Texas wasn't exactly handling that the best. Now, I could be wrong. It could be a CD th or a CD goodness. It could be an AD thing. Um, see, th th there's another comparison right there. CD, AD, it it's poetry. It rhymes. Um, but anyways, you know, it could be a, a Mitchell thing. It could be a personal thing where he's not taking it seriously. Guarantee you they won't let, let that happen at the NFL level. You know, this could very well be a situation like Brandon Ayuk, where he was put in the doghouse for the first couple of years of his career and ended up being a superstar receiver because Kyle Shanahan was mad he couldn't block, right? Or he wouldn't block. Maybe Ad and I, we get the same situation where it's like, hey, buddy, if you're not going to take care of your, your blood sugar, if you're not going to regulate yourself, you're not going to play. And that's a real quick way to get somebody to be like, all right, you know what? You're right. Let me, let me get my shit together. Or if it was a situation where Texas just wasn't monitoring him well enough, then Indianapolis is going to be way different. They have the best doctors they can get. They have the best dietitians they can get, the best nutritions they can get. Like, he's going to have all of the resources he needs at his fingertips to ensure that this doesn't become a problem. And at the end of the day, if you got to give the guy a granola bar on, on the practice field and he's putting up 1,200 yards a year, who the fuck cares? You know? Like, it's, it's not that deep, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but taking a look at what uh, Mitchell does well, you know, like I said, fluid, he's flexible, he's an explosive long strider with great burst and speed, very consistent hands, only had one drop last year, uh, he has the ability to offset DBs with meticulous releases thanks to lateral twitch and speed, he's able to cut on a dime on slants, he utilizes his length and precision to create a lot of separation at the end of his routes, he excels at manipulating DBs with fakes and stutter steps to create separation, He's able to track the ball downfield effectively over his shoulder with incredible body control. He can elevate and high point the ball at a high level when things come together. Uh, just short of 50% contested catch rate on his career, partly thanks to his unreal hand-eye coordination. He's difficult to wrap up after the catch thanks to agility and elusiveness. And this is a big reason why I'm not as worried about 
the uh, the effort thing, right? People saying he doesn't give a lot of effort on his routes when he's not going to get targeted, whatever, is because of the way he plays as a run blocker. This dude likes to block. Have you ever a receiver that likes to block in any capacity? Especially a guy who's a star receiver. You know, this isn't your Equinemia St. Brown. This isn't some guy that's fighting for a roster spot. This was the star receiver at Texas. And he liked to block. You cannot tell me that man's heart is not in it. If he's going out there and hitting corners with the ferocity of a thousand suns on a fucking run play. Like, come on, man. Turn on the tape. Turn on the tape. Now, I know college production is a thing and his wasn't great. I personally don't care. I, when it comes to draft prospects, I'm more looking for traits, unless it's something egregious. Like if Adonai Mitchell went out there, started all, you know, 14 games or whatever, and put up 500 yards, 400 yards, then sure. Concern to be had. But considering he was getting open, and when they looked his way, he was coming down with the football, I'm not worried about it. You know, he knows how to get open. He's got a better quarterback than he had at Texas in Anthony Richardson. I'm not worried about all that. I'm, I'm very, very excited to see what Adonai Mitchell is going to do. I think he's going to be a superstar. I think even though you just paid Michael Pittman to be your number one, I don't think it'll take very long for Adonai to overtake him as the number one. That's not a slight of Pittman. That's just how fucking good Mitchell is. I think Mitchell and um, Pittman and Downs can be one of the best receiver tri trios in the league very, very quickly. And giving that to Anthony Richardson, especially when your tight end room isn't exactly star-studded, is a great thing to have. Fantastic thing to have. And then we get into the third round, just 27 picks later, and the Colts end up taking Matt Goncalves, the offensive tackle, out of the pit. I think it's Goncalves. Goncalves, uh, you know, if I'm mispronouncing it, please let me know in the comments. I'm not great with pronunciations. I'm not going to lie to you. Unless I've heard the guy say it himself, I'll pronounce it 15 different ways until I'm corrected. So... I do apologize if that's incorrect, but Don Calves here is a really interesting case because he's not somebody I watched before the draft, and from what I've been able to gather, a lot of people didn't watch him before the draft. Uh, he's somebody that kind of, you know, went under the radar because he missed his senior season, you know, didn't test. This wasn't exactly like a star-studded tackle class outside of the top couple guys, so he kind of went under the radar for a lot of people. However turning on the tape after the draft, I walked away impressed. Now, this is a guy that's played right tackle, left tackle, guard. Uh, he doesn't get penalized very often. Really good arm length to play inside or outside. Good base and pass protection. He's able to get low to drive opponents off the ball in the run game. He's a smooth mover with consistent footwork and pass protection. His, his arms help him a lot with speed rushers because, like I said, they are on the longer side. Uh, he has pretty active feet, which allow him to get to his landmarks quickly and efficiently. Uh, he has good upper body strength to displace in the run game and hold off bull rushes. Really good uh, grip strength. He's got vice grips for hands, adequate hand usage, and he's really good at picking up on stunts and delayed blitzes and things of that nature to be able to recognize them and then redirect them to keep the quarterback safe, right? Now, that being said, He's not the best lateral mover. He's pretty slow to get out of his stance in that regard. He's not consistently nasty as a run blocker. That's one of those things where it's kind of like, I don't want to say preference, but it's certainly not ideal, right? Uh, he's not going to be great against speed rushers because of that lateral movement. He's not great against inside counters. Not great at re-anchoring after losing leverage. Balance is a little inconsistent. Pad level's high. You know, he's not the most polished guy. But you like him for the, the physical tools. You like him for the the majority of the technique. And I really like what the Colts offensive staff's been able to do with their offensive line. You know, they, they've been able to develop some guys pretty, pretty well. Take a look at Bernard Ryman. You know, someone who was kind of a, a wild card, right? Converted to tackle, ended up being a day two pick proven himself to be a legit starter at left tackle. Blake Freeland was someone they took last year as a bit of a project tackle. Now they've got Goncalves. You know, they like these project tackles and they know what they're doing with them. So while Goncalves might not be the most polished product, he might not be the best product, there's a future there. There's upside. I can see what the Colts see. I like the vision. 
And on top of that, I mean, there weren't any tackles at this point in the draft that I'm like hammering home. You got to take this guy. If you miss on this guy, you know, it's it's a huge whiff. There were a couple guys I did like, you know, Javon Foster out of Mizzou comes to mind. But nobody that I'm like going crazy over. So I think this is a solid pick. I think there's upside there. Can play inside, can play outside. That's the big thing here. You know, Quentin Nelson's not getting any younger, as scary as that might sound. Braden Smith isn't getting any younger. You got to kind of figure out what the future is going to be there. So between Goncalves and Freeland, I think you've probably got at least one starter uh, between those two. And then you get into the fourth round and they take another lineman to potentially be a long-term replacement for one of their older starters and Tanner Bortolini, the center out of Wisconsin. I will say up front, there were some centers here that maybe I liked a little bit more. Look at a Cedric Van Pran, a Hunter Norzad. I can't get mad at, at taking uh, Bortolini here. I think you've got somebody who's a very, very solid interior lineman. Obviously, they're probably going to look at him as a guard. I think that's where he projects best. He's physical. He's aggressive. He's strong. Great football IQ. He's able to pick up on stunts and blitzes. He's able to make, you know, call out adjustments, call out the mic, like things like that. Like you want your center to be the um, the captain of the offensive line, the brains of the offensive line, right? The the quarterback of the offensive line, I guess, for lack of better words. I think Tanner Bertolini is one of the guys that is very, very good at that aspect of the game. Uh, he's a hard worker, especially like when you watch him get beat, he's going to work his ass off to ensure that that doesn't last, right? As soon as he gets beat, he's back up, doesn't let it get in his head. He's trying his best to get back out there and, and put himself back in position. He's really good on down blocks. He's able to wash guys off the line of scrimmage. He has a good base in good bend and pass pro. He's very good in like a phone booth like that. You know, when the close quarters, like when things get kind of tight, he's very, very good at keeping a guy one on one and not letting him get by him. He's experienced. He's versatile. He started four out of five spots on the offensive line. High character praise. Uh, on the flip side, though, length isn't great. He's playing center. I'm not I'm not super worried about a center's length. Not the most athletic guy in the world, but he's athletic enough that he's going to get out there and he's going to do what he needs to do in the run game. Uh, he drops his head a little bit too often. You just got to teach him to keep his head up a little bit. And there were some snapping issues early on in 2023, but they improved as the season went on. And I have no reason to believe that with over a year, most likely of development, um, that that can't continue to improve. So I like this pick quite a bit. You get a guy that I think can be your long-term center replacement for Ryan Kelly. Just a really solid pick to get here in the fourth round. Sure, there may have been guys I liked a little bit more, but good value. You know, I had a mid-fourth round grade on him. About where you take him here. Actually, this might have been late fourth. I don't know. It's late. I I forget how numbers work, man. <laughs> Just know, I thought he deserved to be taken in the fourth round. You took him in the fourth round. That's good in my book, right? And then we get into the fifth round, staying on the offensive side of the ball once again. They take Anthony Gold, the wide receiver out of Oregon State. I put a B-plus on this, and the only reason for that is I feel like there were a couple players on the board that do the same exact thing he does, just better. In Taj Washington and Malik Washington, and I've done this for a lot of teams that took, like, you know, undersized slot receivers before those two went uh, to Miami. Or did they both go to Miami? Oh my God, they both went to Miami. That just set in with me. I, I apologize. Uh, but anyways, Anthony Gold here, uh, fifth year senior, 5'8", 174 pounds. Reminds me a lot of Isaiah McKenzie, which he's not with the Colts anymore, but was for a little bit. So I can see why they'd like him. You know, just a, a good backup to Josh Downs. We'll put it that way. A, a shifty slot receiver, good gadget player can be on kicks and punts if you need him to. He's got the speed to flip and stretch the field. Uh, he's got really good acceleration and burst. He's quick out of his routes. Gets up to top speed in an instant. Good release thanks to his foot quickness. He's fluid. Wasn't the most productive guy in the world, uh, but he does show all sorts of traits that suggest he can be at the next level. Pretty good after the catch. He's able to track and adjust to the deep ball pretty well. Probably would have been more productive last year had his quarterback not sucked. Uh, just to be straight up. And like I said, he can be a contributor on special teams. You know, if you want a guy out there for kicks and punts, he can absolutely do that. Now, sure, he's going to have all the problems that a little guy has. He's not big. He's not going to do well against press. He's not the most physical receiver in the world. 
you're not drafting a guy that's five foot eight and saying, hey, go moss that corner. You know, we're not dumb. We know what these guys are. They're gadget players, and that's okay. Everybody needs a good gadget player. All the best teams have one. I think Anthony Gold can be a very, very effective one. And if not, good special teamer. And, you know, God forbid something happens to Josh Downs, knock on wood. He's a good backup there. I just think there were guys still on the board that were better than him that I would have taken here to do his job better. But I digress. They're the professionals. I like what the Colts tend to do when it comes to these athletic players, so I can't complain too much. However, it does impact their draft grade here. And then we move on here in the fifth round, and they end up taking Jalen Carley's, the safety slash linebacker out of Missouri. And this guy, man, the size, 6'3", 227 pounds, ran a 4'5". You know exactly what he is coming to Indianapolis to do. And that's play that role that guys like Ronnie Harrison have been playing, where you're a safety that's playing in the box, a dime linebacker. For lack of better words, that kind of Cam Chancellor role. Not comparing this guy to Cam Chancellor, please do not take that out of context. Just saying a similar type of role where you're a safety, but you're essentially playing linebacker. He's got the size, he's got the quickness, he's got the physicality. You know, he's somebody that has played in the nickel, he's played middle linebackers, shown really good stuff at all three positions, including safety. He's a fluid backpedaler, has the ability to change direction in short areas really well. He can cover a lot of ground in those short to intermediate areas of the field, so he's going to be playing up at the line of scrimmage quite a bit. He's able to stay with receivers vertically thanks to his really good linear speed. He's able to use his length and size to stay in phase with tight ends and can be a weapon in red zone coverage. Going to get probably a good bit of red zone uh, opportunities and, and usage. He's very aggressive and tenacious as a run defender from all three levels as a deep safety as an intermediate safety, as a box safety. He just likes to get after it against the run. Uh, he's able to shed blocks pretty efficiently as a run defender. There were times where he straight up stood up offensive linemen and were able to stack and shed as a run defender. He's really good at shooting gaps thanks to his timing and burst. He's a really good tackler, able to square up his body and you know play with control and balance and just wrap guys up and take them down. Very fundamental tackler. I know that's not an exciting thing, but to me it is. I'm a sucker for the fundamentals, especially nowadays when we see so many guys that are like coverage first. Seeing a guy who just takes pride in his ability to wrap up and drop makes me really happy. Uh, zero penalties in 2023, by the way. Very disciplined player. He only has two on his career. Nine career interceptions. And he's going to be a hell of a special teamer, if nothing else. Now, that being said, his speed is pretty much straight line speed. Uh, his hips can be a little tight. His vision and awareness and coverage aren't always, you know, ideal. Definitely a little bit of room to improve and grow there. Spatial awareness isn't great, that type of thing. He will get a little overzealous against the run and over pursue at times. And there's some times where he's not going to be able to keep up with the receiver when they're breaking on their route. I don't foresee him as somebody that's going to be stuck in a lot of man coverage. I really think this is somebody that if you have him on the field, you'd rather run in zone, and he's sitting in a zone or trigger into the run, or you just send him at the fucking quarterback. He's got the straight line speed. He's got the ability to shed block. He's got the toughness. He's got the aggression. Let this man kill a quarterback or two. You know, I think there's some exciting untapped stuff with Jalen Carlisle here. Uh, the only thing I would say that I don't love about this pick is I would have rather have seen them taken uh, Williams, James Williams, out of Miami, very similar player, just a little bit bigger uh, and a little bit meaner, a little bit scarier, a little bit quicker. He ended up going to the Titans. That's the only like gripe I have with this pick. But other than that, I think it's good value. I think it's a good player. He's somebody that is going to see the field sooner rather than later, I would assume. You know, very much in that role that Ronnie Harrison is currently in, because obviously I don't see him as a long term starter for the Colts. I think he's somebody that you're very much just playing there now. Just an exciting player to watch. I am really, really excited to see what he's going to do. And then we move on to their final fifth round pick, being Jalen Simpson, the safety out of Auburn. Take everything I just said about the other Jalen, Jalen Carlisle, throw it out the window. Simpson's the exact opposite, where Carlisle is this great, big, athletic, scary box safety that almost looks like he was built in the lab. Jalen Simpson's six foot, 179 pounds, and is really good in coverage doesn't do a whole lot against the run and that's perfectly okay you got your yin and your yang here right you get somebody who can be a true deep safety 
Uh, he's got the speed. He's got the explosiveness. He can run with receivers down the seam and across the field. He does a really good job at breaking on the ball once it's in the air. He's really aggressive at the catch point. He's a ball hawk with really good eyes and really sure hands, really firm hands uh, to bring down interceptions. He does play a little bit better around the line of scrimmage than you'd expect from someone who's 179 pounds. But that's not saying a whole lot because he's still 179 pounds, you know, or at least was in college. Maybe he's bulked up a little bit. I I'm not sure at this point. You know, it's been a couple of months since he last played his college football. Um, but that being said, he's played corner. He's played safety. Uh, he's really instinctive. He has good arm length and he's a heat seeking missile when it comes to breaking up passes, not so much against the run. Like I said, the only thing you got to worry about with him is the run defense. His hips are also a little stiff when it comes to flipping him in man coverage. But if you're playing him as a safety, you're probably not expecting him to flip his hips all that much in man coverage. So I think he'll be OK. Just a very, very exciting depth safety, right? As we move on to the sixth round, they take another player in the secondary being Micah Abraham, the corner out of Marshall. Not a whole lot to say here. 5'9", 185 pounds. Just your typical nickel. You know, he had really good production, broke up 55 passes, had 12 interceptions. He's quick to accelerate to the ball. He's really good ball skills in general. Uh, he's able to, you know, close in on different areas of the field when he senses the ball's going that direction. He's going to try his best to play run defense, but he's a little undersized. So not always going to be the most effective, but he's going to try his heart out. Back pedal isn't great not exactly the most technically refined player but you've got a hell of a teacher for him in kenny moore right you've got one of the better nickels in the sport he's not getting any younger so maybe micah abraham can work to one day take over for him take his spot i think this is a solid fun uh long-term projection if he ends up making the roster we're getting really close to cut day so i guess we'll find out uh if he doesn't make the roster then so be it if he does, then I think you've got somebody that, you know, can learn a thing or two from Kenny Moore and, and maybe end up taking over in an ideal world. And if not, it's the sixth round. And then finally, in the seventh round, Jonah Laulu, the defensive tackle out of Oklahoma. He's another tweener. You know, the Colts love their tweeners. 6'5", 292 pounds, good height, good length. Got plenty of frame to add some muscle if you want him to bulk up and play a true D tackle role. He's a good athlete, really explosive. He has good pad level high motor, tries his ass off all over the field. No quit in this guy's game whatsoever. He's played across the defensive line. That's kind of what your his, his calling card is that versatility. Um, he's got good agility, good change of direction. That being said, wasn't a productive college player, not the strongest guy in the world, and he needs to develop a little bit in terms of his pass rush tool belt and his pass rush plan and things like that. But he's an athletic tweener in the seventh round. You know the Colts love their tweeners. So grabbing him uh, we'll see what happens another guy that if he makes the roster great he's got some good mentors if he doesn't not the end of the world right it's another ras freak for um for the colts to kind of lick their chops over but that being said damn good draft class damn good draft class gonna give them an a i think they made two of the best picks in the draft with latu and mitchell Two guys that are not only going to be day one immediate impact starters, but guys that I think can be all pro caliber for a decade plus in this league. After that, no picks that necessarily blew me away, but no picks where I'm sitting here scratching my head either. Right? You know, I just got done talking about Jacksonville's draft class. Woof. Right? Looking at that and then looking at the Colts, it's night and day. It's, it's very, very nice to be able to talk positively about a team after going in on Jacksonville because I'm a positive person. I don't like to be super negative. You know, some of these guys at the end of this draft, maybe they don't make the roster. Maybe they do. So be it. Uh, if they do, I hope they work their asses off and they find a role on this team. You got some guys that can be day one starters, like I already said. You got some guys that project to be nice backups long term. Some guys that project to be potential long term replacements for some of your veterans. Just a really good draft class. No real holes. The only critique I have is I wish they would have taken one of the Washingtons over gold. But I do think gold's a good player. I, I, I see the vision there. I don't think he was ever drafted, anything like that. Just a small critique, because at the end of the day, you got to be objective. And if I'm just sitting here saying everything, everything is sunshine and rainbows, I, I look a little biased, right? So you got to take the good with the bad, but there's a hell of a lot more good here. In fact, it's all good. You know, even if I can nitpick a little bit, it's all good. Future's bright for the Colts. Plenty of reasons to be excited. 
Richardson to Mitchell is going to hit like crack for the next decade. Going to be one of the most fun tandems in the sport. And I cannot wait to watch Latu come out and cement himself as a top 10, top five edge rusher sooner rather than later, because that dude is incredible. I'm kind of jealous that the Bears didn't end up with him, to tell you the truth, but you know, I, I can't complain with how the Bears draft turned out. So all in all, fantastic work by the Colts. Just so much to get excited about if you're a Colts fan, man. You had a chance on the throwback. This, a, was, this was an ill-advised throw. What an unbelievable catch by Colt the Met. And he, and he cups it too. No movement when he hits the ground, tucked up against his shoulder. Wow. Using that 